I'm so glad you're here tonight. This is um, Welcome to Colonial Church. What we're going to be doing tonight is having a conversation that our church's Justice and Witness Committee um, started planning a while back. And what it really is is to ask some of the questions about what it means to be growing up in this community right now. Um, we've got some ex experts here. Uh, Don Heimer in the middle, who is the assistant DA for, uh, in Johnson County. And then um, Janie Yen Yankuto? Yanisito. Yanisito, thank you. <laughs> Who is a, a, a uh, Johnson County mental health, uh, mental health professional. And then Adam Taylor, who is the SRO officer at Indian Hills. And I was, I was teaching confirmation today. I mentioned that he'd be here, and they all, they all instantly replied that they really liked Adam. And so he has a little fan club. Um, but these professionals are going to be talking to us a little bit tonight about what are some of the issues that kids are facing growing up today because as a parent, this is a very different world than the world that I knew growing up and that pretty much anybody, have, anybody has. There's a lot of new, new factors that are involved in their lives. Some things are constant and then a lot of things have changed. Tonight we're going to be videotaping this too to put this online for people because I think the content of what you guys, the question, uh, questions that have come in are just so good and I think that this is just going to be a necessary, uh, uh, a necessary conversation for lots of parents. I think a lot of these questions, um, honestly, I, I'm excited to hear what you have to say tonight. And so without further ado, we'll get into our questions tonight. These questions have come in from our, our Justice and Witness Committee. Uh, people in the colonial commu community as well as the wider community have submitted these questions that we're going to be asking tonight. Now, we're going to kind of take these questions, uh, uh, ask the questions sort of uh, time. But first of all, uh, kind of introduce yourself. And we'll just kind of start at that end of the table and move this direction. So um, feel free. Um, my name is Janie Anacito. And I have been at Johnson County Mental Health for 16 years now. I work in, um, I'm the clinical supervisor of the Family Focused Children's Services. Um, I started out at Johnson County as a team leader, and then I've been in this position about close to 12 years, I guess. Um, so, love it. I think it's great programs. Um, so. Now, when you're working with schools, how do you how do you identify kids in the schools that could use some help? We we work closely with the schools. Um, one of the things that we do, we try to do a couple of times a year, but we try to get together with the school social workers and the counselors and the psychologists to just talk with them about um, mental health services, how they might refer kids to either Johnson County Mental Health or um, maybe some private providers in the community. and. Um, one thing I didn't explain, we have uh, traditional mental health services which would include medication management and individual and family therapy in the office and then we have a community-based program, community-based services program and that program is for kids who have more severe issues and need more intensive services. So uh, the case managers, the community-based services case managers actually work in the schools a lot of times. Okay. They will work, be, I always say, they kind of work behind the scenes. So they're working, they might be meeting with the parent and the teacher to develop behavior plans. Um, and they're obviously, they're working with the kid to develop whatever they need. It could be coping skills, anger management skills. They may need to help focusing, that type of thing. Um, we don't work in the schools as much in Shawnee Mission as we do in some of the other districts, but we can work in the schools where we're actually in the classrooms with the kids and we're helping them either stay on task or if they're getting too upset or something, then we're taking them out and, you know, very planned with the school. This, the school principals involved, the teachers involved, the counselor, social worker. It's really, it's a team effort with that parent and that child. Um, we also work with the school resource officers in the schools um, and um, the school resource officers, a lot of times they're the ones that identify issues with kids and 
and they may actually call our crisis line to to get some advice or get some tips on what to do or where to go with a kid. You know, one of the questions, and I think Adam, you might have some of your thoughts on this too. One of the questions that I as a parent have kind of had um, over the last few years is we've seen, I think, the, the jarring acts of horrific violence that have happened out of places. And so one of those questions I've asked is, how do they, on one hand, it, it terrifies me a little bit if we're profiling students, and on the other hand, it terrifies me if we're not profiling students a little bit. How do you, what are you looking at when you, um, how, do you how do you identify uh, a student that may be having potential issues, and how does that profiling process happen? You want me to answer it? Uh, you can answer <laughs> that one. I think on, on, on our end, um, we don't profile. Um, but on our end, what we're looking at, when a kid comes to us, we're looking at what their history is. So if they've had a history of acting out violently or aggressively, then that means that there's more of a potential for that person to act out in that manner. So so that's um, one of the ways. I think one of the big things with a lot of the things that you hear about that's, that's happened across the nation, a lot of times um, there's not been a lot of intervention or there's not been a lot of um, maybe success in outreaching to those to those people. So I think it can be difficult. I think if somebody is is noticing that there's problems. That's one of the things we talk to the counselors, the social workers, psychologists primarily, that if you're noticing something's changing with, with the um, student, like they used to be a good student, but now they're not. They used to come to school every day, now they're not. Um, they don't care about their parents. Those kinds of things are all just Anything that is a change from what the norm was for that kid would be just something you would want to check into. And if I could just say really quick, one of the things I think that's great with Shawnee Mission is they are starting to train all of their, um, everybody in their school on mental health first aid. And, and what that is, it's like um, first aid. But it's really talking about what are, what are, what are some of those early signs or symptoms, or what if somebody is in crisis in the grocery store, how would you react, how would you respond? Um, and so I think that's helping the teachers, it's, it's kind of helping everybody, because it's not just the people who, who are in the classrooms, it's the, um, the secretaries, it's the maintenance staff, and that is actually offered to anyone. And I mean, you, you all could go to mental health first aid, and it's really, it's just, how do you how do you intervene? How do you how how can you very um, supportively and gently help somebody who's having a crisis or something's happening? And, and what role do parents play when you're when you're working with a child? At, at what point do you make a decision to involve parents? Is it from the beginning, or what what is the how does that work? Uh, what we always tell parents is um, that nothing's going to happen unless the parent is involved. There's sometimes that we can work with a child on their own and the parents are completely uninvolved, um, but that is very, um, so much less successful. Um, a lot of times what happens if a kid has um, behavioral problems or a mental illness, the 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 way the household is functioning changes. And a lot of times it's not functioning in a, um, a great way. It's just your coping skills kind of break down. And maybe um, your, uh, your rules are not quite as, as consistent as they used to. The structure in the home maybe is, is not as consistent. Um, we see a lot of parents who are afraid of their kids or they're really worried that if they hold their kid accountable, their kid is going to hurt themselves. And, um, so what we're talking to parents about is you have to be the one that changes first, and then your child changes. And you, you have to provide that structure and that foundation for whatever changes happen. So working with families, working with parents is absolutely vital and um, we do that to whatever extent that we possibly can. 
There's been a stories in the media over uh, problems with Johnson County Mental Health. And can you explain the reorganization and, and uh, how it's functioning now? And also, uh, the question was, is there adequate funding? Um, uh, no, there's not adequate funding. Um, if I could just answer that one first. In the last um, maybe four to six years, um, uh, within the state, well, Johnson County has lost a huge amount of funding that we used to get from the state. A lot of that funding was to help us to do outreach, to provide services for people who could not pay, um, and um, just it, it's 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 really huge. And and to help support um, having adequate staffing. Um, as far as the problems that the mental health center is, has been going through, that's partially because we've lost so much funding from the state that we're having these problems. Um, there are also some internal issues. I think right now we're on a really good um, we're on a really good path to get that corrected. We have a we have a lot of involvement with the with the county the county manager's office. There's um, a, a huge commitment from the county that they want Johnson County Mental Health to survive and to thrive. Um, so it's it's been it's been an interesting process, but I can honestly say I feel really good about where we're going. Um, it's going to take us probably a little while, you know, maybe even a couple of years to get ourselves to the point where we're really stable financially. But I think the county's really with us, and they're going to help us. You had talked about some of the behaviors that you would look for in a student that might tr trigger there being some kind of contact made with the student or with the family or something like that. Um, one of the just really basic questions is, so what does that cost? If you are a family too and, and, this, and you're going through this, I mean, that would be, um, what is the cost for families to do? We have a sliding fee scale, so we really look at what um, families can afford to pay the traditional um, mental health services are generally covered by insurance. Um, their mental health parity um, went, went through, I guess, about a year ago. It's really starting to take effect now. And what that means is that insurances can no longer say, I'm not covering mental health or substance use types of um, disorders. Um, so it, the private insurance depends a lot of, I mean, it really depends on what kind of plan somebody has. They could have a $20 copay or they could, you know, have a $3,000 deductible that they have to meet. You guys are probably familiar with that. For community-based services, for those kids who are, who are um, re really severe, and um, most of those kids are at risk for hospitalization or um, residential treatment, or they're at risk for being taken out of the home, um, either in the legal system or as a child in need of care. That is paid for by Medicaid or by um, what it's, it's called the um, Severely Emotionally Disturbed Waiver. And what a waiver means, it's a Medicaid program, and it's actually a federal program, and the waiver waives the regular financial eligibility criteria. So kids, kids have to qualify clinically and they have to qualify financially, but the financial criteria is based only on the child's income and assets, which means most of the kids qualify. Um, sometimes they might have social security disability or social security, like if a parent died or something, or child support. Those are, those are, considered the child's income. Um, so if that's in place, that's very helpful. That's a short-term program, but that can be um, vital. When I, when I started, the waiver program had just started in the state, and what we have seen in um, the community-based services program is, I think when I started, we had maybe 90 kids in services for community-based services and now at any given time we have between 450 and 550. That's that's very low com considering what actually what we actually need to be doing but it just kind of gives you a, an idea of 
how the way, and it's really a lot due to the waiver program. Okay. Wow. Okay, that, that, it's probably more than you wanted to no, know. No, no, that is exactly <laughs> what I wanted to know, to be honest with you. One of the, and I'm thinking about it in terms of this question actually from two sides too. One of it is, is, is um, one of the ministries of this church, one of our, our good ministry partners, really works at kids that after they turn 18, who are who either come from households where they have not gotten their independent learning skills, or for parents who have children that are going to be turning 18, and they know their kids haven't developed those independent living skills at that point, too. What resources could you recommend for that? Um, there's not a lot. Okay. Um, if, if a, if a um, youth has mental mental health problems um, that are severe enough, what we would do with some of those those kids who are turning 18 is we have a transitional youth program, and so they would transition to that program, and they could stay in that program up until their 22nd birthday. And um, they really work with the child on independent living skills and helping them to, you know, maybe um, get into college, get a job, get um, an apartment, budget, that kind of stuff. We do a little of that with, with the, you know, the 15, 16, 17 year old kids, but um, they really are the experts. If they do not have a mental illness and, or what we see a lot is, ki is kids with developmental disabilities like the autism spectrum disorders and those kids, um, they just may have a they may have a dif difficult time living independently. Um, and the developmental disability system in Kansas is, um, there's a huge waiting list to get on their waiver. There's like a seven to eight year waiting list to get on their waiver. Um, and, and they have some options and we, and we work very closely with them, with some of our kids that we feel need those services. Um, there's some crisis funding, um, but that's really difficult if you come from a two-parent family um, household. Um, so there are some independent living programs, but a lot of those are, you know, you got to pay out of pocket. There are none in Johnson County. There's, there's one in um, Kansas City, Kansas. There's um, one or two in, in Jackson County on the Missouri side. But that's that's a gap. That's a real gap. You had mentioned the um, you know people that are on the autism spectrum, and um, also you know the attention deficit disorders. One of the questions people have had, and I think this has been made a lot of in recent, a lot of the violence as people have been looking in, at a. I, one of my fears is actually there becomes an almost a demonizing of people who are on the autism spectrum after some of the, after some of the. Um, news reports that have gone on for the last couple of years. How do you explain the market increase in the number of people that are diagnosed with that? That's, that's tough. I think a lot of it is just um, better diagnosing. Um, uh, it'll, it, it, that's, that's, that's been the, the explanation that the experts have had is that, that we're just identifying people. I look back to my childhood and I, I, you know, you think of some of the kids that you knew and you just thought, oh, that's a quirky kid, that's a little bit weird, that kid's a little bit off, not very good socially. Those kids are getting diagnosed now. Um, whereas back a little bit more than a few years ago, um, <laughs> they didn't get diagnosed. And I think that um, ADHD, I think that there's some things that, that um, in the next couple of years, there's a new, um, it's called the Diagnostic Statistical Manual is coming out, That's it, it's new. And some of these things, really the autism diagnosis I think is going to change. And I, I'm curious to see what will happen, but I, I think what will happen is you will see a reduction in the number of kids who are diagnosed with autism. And there's a new, a new diagnosis that's called social communication disorder, and I think a lot of those kids 
who have been, you've heard Asperger's, they will be um, diagnosed with social communication disorder. And autism will be more the, the classic autism or the, you know, the flapping, the, you know, um, rocking, some of those, and, mm -hmm. and um, just not able to really communicate. Those kids will stay in that autism disorder. Well, the last question that we had, had for you tonight is one that actually, and I, and I feel this one really, it's part of the church community here in, in the wider community too. What can parents, churches, people do to be supportive of you in your work? Well, one of the things that we are really trying to do now, we have um, a parent support specialist. <laughs> Um, we are um, starting to work with corrections in a program that's called Strengthening Families. Um, and we are working with churches and to provide these classes at, at churches. One of the things that, that corrections has seen that has been amazing to me and, and I think really needed, what's happened with those Strengthening Families classes the um, church members help with those, and so they might help with um, child care, or um, sometimes they help with dinner or something like that. But the families have been connecting to people in the church, and that has given those families natural supports that they don't have. What, what we see all the time is um, that parents come to us and they have burned all their bridges. They, their family doesn't want anything to do with them. Their friends don't want anything to do with them. They feel like the schools don't like their kids. It's mostly not true. Um, so this is an opportunity for them to develop some more social supports. Um, it, 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 that, when you have a kid who has severe behaviors, um, and you don't have a break, it's, it's, that's huge to be able to have that, um, some natural support. And our services don't, I mean, they don't last forever. So to have that natural support system that they can turn to once we're gone is huge. Okay. So okay. I might contact you about no, please do. please do. I, I, I mean, that's that's why we're doing this tonight. We want to know about these about these things in way that ways that people can be supportive of it too. Um, as we, we kind of take a moment now to see if, if you all have, if there are any questions, kind of what you've heard talked about at this point. Are, are there things that that are on your on your mind right now in terms of mental health in Johnson County that you'd like to ask? Uh, why why in Johnson County? all of our resources that we have, why is there not a adult, a transition program for young adults with severe disabilities? There is, um, but there's, there's um, one of the things that's lacking is housing. And um, there are some options, and I'm not as familiar with all the options for the young adults, um, but they do have some options. I know um, they used to have Breakthrough House, which provided some transitional housing, and um, they ended up having to um, close that house down because of, um, there was, I think the pipe broke or something and just flooded everything. So we do, for, for kids who have, for those young adults who have severe mental illness, there is a transitional age program. And, um, and they do help kids try, or those young adults try, um, learn independent living skills, like I said, how, how to get a job, that kind of stuff. Uh, but when you look at the kids around, John, how many how many young adults we have in Johnson County, that's a drop in the bucket. It's, it's tiny. There is a program called Stand Up Parenting. It's um, if you're familiar with Tough Love, it's based on Tough Love. They provide some assistance to parents um, in, in the form of support groups, some educational, um, um, some education, and then even some uh, in the home kinds of support that they'll offer. But it, I, I don't have an answer for you. It's, I think it's just, a, a bigger 
it's it's just part of a bigger problem that we just don't we just in general we don't have enough. Any other questions? Michelle. Uh, you mentioned that you don't do a whole lot of work in the Shawnee Mission School District. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Um, Shawnee Mission has made a decision that they um, um, that that they want to provide what is needed in the schools. Um, we are, you know, we continue to work with Shawnee Mission to see if there are ways that that we can um, work around that. Um, um, I think there are a lot of reasons that they don't do that. Um, we work in some of the schools. Some of the schools are, are allowing us to work in the schools, but it's, it's a decision that the administration has made. And they have a new superintendent now um, who may make some changes with that. And what I've heard is, he is there's going to be a bigger emphasis on mental health in the school. So it'll be interesting to see what he does. Okay.